And then I decided to drop the epigraph. When I was a kid, French President Poincaré once visited a World War I graveyard under a blazing sun, and the extreme light made appear on his face for one-tenth of a second, a rictus that could be mistaken for a grin. A photograph got that moment, and for the rest of his career, he was berated by the rightest opponents as the man who laughs in cemeteries. It may be that this childhood's memory did help me to generate a defiant curiosity to its images. I had always refused the omniscient, anonymous voice of the classical traveler. For 30 years in Paris, I had been dreaming about Peking without knowing it. Contrarily to what people say, the use of the first person in films tends to be a sign of humility. All I have to offer is myself. Of course, this work in no way constitutes an autobiography, and I've permitted myself to drift in all directions. Nonetheless, if you're going to work on memory, you might as well use the one you've always got on you. Now, perhaps it's about time to bring some clues. And anyway, this will remain between us, won't it? I was filming Le Jolime, completely immersed in the reality of Paris 1962 and the euphoric discovery of direct cinema. You will never make me say cinéma vérité. La vérité? Quelle vérité? They were the blossoming years of the political cinema in France. I derive a certain pride to be able to date the beginning of our film experiments with factory workers from 1967, not 1968. On the cruise days off, I photographed a story I didn't completely understand. It was in the editing that the pieces of the puzzle came together. And it wasn't me who designed the puzzle. I'd have a hard time taking credit for it. It just happened. That's all. Once I'm familiar with the material, I'll do it as if it's one shot from beginning to end. With some exceptions, that's my usual way to work. I couldn't find the words to explain to an editor, for instance, operations that come instinctively to my mind when I'm at the editing table. I was very conscious of the limitations that plague the first image synthesizers. Setting these images in the editing like that could create some misunderstanding, as if I boasted, this is modernity, when those were the first stumbling steps on the long road that would lead to the computerized and virtual world. With stolen film stock, borrowed editing table, friendly technicians and last not least, an Iranian cameraman, I managed to build up a short documentary called Le Train en Marche. For the first time, Alexander Ivanovich told in his own words the whole story of seeing a train. Medvedkin was to say, there I learnt the essential. He looks. It's at that point, brooding over that exemplary lifespan, that I started to conceive a new approach to this long-born project, whose purpose would be not so much to achieve a biography, however fascinating, but to draw the portrait of an era through the portrait of a man. This train doesn't remind me of my cine train of 40 years ago at all. The carriages aren't the same, the rails are now. But the comrades of the Slon group persuaded me to come here to make my story about that train of 40 years ago seem more graphic, and to make it easier to understand the conditions in which we worked in our day. That the subject of this memory should be a photographer and a filmmaker does not mean that his memory is essentially more interesting than that of the next man or next woman. Only that he has left traces, contours to draw up his maps. I had always been convinced that in my small essays, the 
untold part was more meaningful than the blabbering. I tried to give them their best moment, often imperceptible in the stream of time, sometimes one fiftieth of a second that makes them truer to their inner selves. I see her. Il m'a vu. She knows that I see her. Elle m'offre son regard, mais That's juste at an angle where it is still possible to act as though it was not addressed to me. And at the end, the real glance, straightforward, that lasted a twenty-fourth of a second, the length of a film frame. Out of the two hours you spend in a movie theater, you spend one of them in the dark. It's this nocturnal portion that stays with us, that fixes our memory of a film in a different way than the same film seen on television or on a monitor. The images gathered, the images created, together with some images borrowed. In this way, out of these just opposed memories is born a fictional memory. Poets are made to create such moments. Moments of borrowing a strength that is not ours. But the film, moving as it is with that unique testimony, remained for me kind of a trailer the first draft of the real film I still long to do in an undefined future. My fondest wish is that there might be enough familiar codes here. The travel picture, the family album, the totem animal. That the visitor could come to replace my images with his. My memories with his. And that my memory should serve as a springboard for his own pilgrimage in time regained. Yours faithfully, Chris Marker.